This is Musings of the Shide podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shide. This is episode 124, My Advice for Five Cents, the Bitcoin business episode. Hello, this is Rosia Shide with another episode, a continuation of the series about the, the setup for the uh, block size debate. Uh, here we're talking about Bitcoin businesses. Uh, some of them that had, you know, the heads of these different businesses that have spoken out about either for or against or the different options available for the uh, block size, as well as uh, a couple of them that have made their own proposals um, into the fray, if you will. Well, we won't actually go into the technical details of their proposals. We'll talk about the ones that have supported or have uh, put forth their own plans. But before we get on um, with this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about the news. The Thieves Who Still Suck in Water Warships Right Down to the Bolts by Catherine Mills. I'm not going to read the entire article and it comes from outside online, but I just find it very, the story just in itself very fascinating because just the kind of the economics of it. So here we go. Last November, a, t- a team of international divers departed the Indonesian island of Java on a mission to suck in World War II warships. The Dutch government had tasked them to assess the conditions of two particular Dutch vessels, the Hermes Java and the Hermes Dorotter, both sunk in 1944, or not 1944, 1942, during the Battle of the Java Sea, not far from the remote island of Bainu. Conditions there are notoriously dangerous, seemingly endless schools of stinging jellyfish and current, currents capable of sweeping away even a master diver. Those same currents are also kill visibility underwater, limiting it to a little as an arm's length. Ocean depths in that area can be more than 200 feet, so the dive team knew they had to get plenty far down to see any sign of the ship. But as they descend deeper and deeper, the ships remained elusive. In moments like that, a good diver can't help but run through a quick mental check. Are we using the right coordinates? Do we have the properly set anchor? Have we begun to drift? As the sea floor came into view, answers to, to a few of those questions became clear. The divers had not drifted. The anchor had held, and they were precisely in the right place. The ship, on the other hand, was not. What be di- these divers should not should have found was a 6,444-ton cruiser, complete with a tower, turrets, and catapult, a ship long and large enough to launch a seaplane. Instead, they found only the impression of a hole on an empty sea floor. The vessel that had once lain there had first been discovered in 2001. It was surveyed a year later. Since then, recreational divers had visited. And sure, ocean currents can drag debris from a down plane or even cause a re- a renaissance gallon to resurface, but this was a massive steel ship. The only way it was going to go anywhere was if someone or lots of someone had moved it. The team searched for the other battle casualties in the area with no less ha- haunting. The U.S. Perch, a 300-foot-long American submarine, was gone. So were the two British sh- ships, the 329-foot Her Majesty's uh, Encounter and the 570-foot Exeter. A huge section of the corner around 322-foot Dutch warship was also missing. Seven ship, seven, wow, that's a tongue tie. Seven ships in all, either lost without a trace or grossly scavenged. In eighth, the U.S. Houston was mostly intact, but it was clearly clear that pirates had begun gunning as well. The very nature of these warships is what makes both, them both so difficult to remove from the ocean floor and so appealing to the E. Illegal salvagers ballsy enough to try. Consider this: the perch was a was as long as a football field and twenty six feet wide. Displaced nearly two thousand tons when submerged. The encounter and extra belonged to a robust, robust class of British destroyers that carried torpedoes, anti aircraft weaponry, and a complement of about one hundred and fifty sailors each. The Dorotter was the largest of all, with a length of more than 560 feet, and all now gone without a trace. Okay, so kind of ex- jump, jumping down here. So, even in poor conditions, Glean Steel fetches about $150 a ton in international markets. A recovered destroyer can easily reach, result in a profit of $100,000, handling and fortune by many standards. But a lot of money if you're struggling to get by in a developing nation. There's a ton more money to be had if you, if you find ships built before the dawn of the nuclear testing. 
Steel is made by melting iron at super high temperatures and infusing it with carbon. To make sure these carbon levels don't go get too high, steel makers blow oxygen into the mix, along with ambient at, 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 uh, ambient atmospheric particles. That includes radiation. Natural elements like radon create low-level natural radi radioactivity. We increase those levels exponentially when countries like the U.S. and Russia began nuclear testing in the 1940s. France, England, and China jumped on the bomb bandwagon a few years later, and with each detonation, radioactivity levels in our atmosphere increased. That meant each time steelmakers were blowing oxygen into the new steel, they were also blowing nuclear particles into it. And I think that's very, very important because that's, you know, radioactivity is one of the things that, you know, sets the modern um, age from ages past. This is how paintings are determined to be, whether they're fraudulent or something like that. Fabrics, uh, authenticity, if you will, when it comes to certain historical f artifacts and certain um, products, if you will, is by the radiation level. And even certain parts of the, the world, just depending on how the fallout occurred with these destination, uh, det destinations, detonations, there are certain places that have a higher level versus other levels, and you can kind of trace where things come from. That's not true for steel used to fabricate pre-1942 vessels, which is virtually radiation-free, and its clean status makes these metals particularly valuable for some technical applications of nuclear medicine, and more commonly, the development of nuclear energy and weapons. No one knows where to, or to whom the steel from these illegal savage ships is being sold. Survivors and descendants of the Houston said they don't really care. Last month marked the 75th anniversary of the ship's sinking, and they plan to commiserate the event with celebrations of quiet remembrances. Instead, they now find themselves pushing for strict new laws in an effort to save the ship and the remains of those who died aboard, even at the expense of continuing dive access. Meanwhile, history buffs and amateur divers alike are blowing up online discussion boards with speculation how could someone steal a single warship, let alone three or four, without leaving a trace? So they, they just kind of broke out all the economics of just like the, the tonnage of these uh, the steel fetches, but given the added caveat of the fact that this particular type of steel is radiation field, uh, radiation radiation free, I imagine that hundred thousand dollars is whew, way more, particularly on the black market, particularly if you're seeking to make certain types of tools, uh, weapons, if you will, if you're a nation seeking to get up onto the uh, into the new club, if you will that this would probably fetch a kind of a premium. And just, I would imagine the technical skill set uh, to be able to break these ships apart must have been pretty high-end, if you will. Um, so there is a Dutch TV service called The Mind of the Universe, which is an open source science TV, where all their discussions and topics they talk about, they make... Um, available open source um, you have all the information is available to you along with interviewing of all these different people um, I have a link in the show notes it's just a very interesting find I've been kind of exploring it I just wanted to share I kind of like what I've seen so far but there's a link in the show notes for it uh, Prism by Shapeshift brace yourself prisons are coming countdown to the world's first built entirely on smart contracts brought to you by Shapeshift so they had it blotted out, but if you want to participate in this, it's one of these other kind of ICO prism, you know, projects that seem to be coming out, particularly with Ethereum. Um, excuse me. There's one that's dealing with, um, again, decentralizing the internet, which we talked about on um, a word of the metaverse when we spoke about crypto wars um, and just in general we're talking about decentralized the internet uh, VPN, there's an Ethereum contract out there that's about decentralizing Ethereum but Shapeshift um, as we know and we'll talk about it in the the show not the show but the core of the show because of the Eric Voorhees is the founder of Shapeshift 
and what he has to say about the uh, block size debate. But it's just interesting, all these different types of projects out there, especially coming from people that have had, um, you might say, uh, strong reputations within the business. Um, people trust them. They've had a good reputation and they're building off of it. But they are um, Consensus 2017, which is a um, one of those industry um, convention places. They plan on making an announcement, May, which is occurring May 22nd, at that uh, announcing what their new smart contract platform is going to be like. So it will be interesting to see. And then a, a particular project that has been following since it came, came out into existence, Spells of Genesis game launches for iPhone and Android. Um, Spell of Genesis, if you remember, is a trade carding game that um, is built off the blockchain. They have these really impressively gorgeous looking cards that you can trade and play with play with and it had this entire uh, gaming system built around it so that is it for the news um on to the core of the episode as we talk about the bitcoin business uh now on to some bitcoin businesses so i'm going to read a little bit from this bitcoin.com article which talks about the the top 10 most influential people in bitcoin and we talked about Peter Wool when we talked about uh, he's on here as part of Blockstream. We'll talk about Blockstream, but uh, he's also because he's a developer, he's on this list. But number nine is Barry Silbert. Uh, Barry Silbert has been one of the most active angel investors in Bitcoin to date. He's the founder of the Digital Currency Group, uh, which invested in Purse.io, which I did a review of on Hiroshi's Thought Bubble. Uh, he focuses on developing Bitcoin infrastructures by investing in starting and growing companies in the Bitcoin space. He's injected funds in over 40 Bitcoin-related startups through via the Bitcoin Opportunity Corporation, but the best business session companies as BitGo, BitPay, BitPagos, BitPaces, Chain, Circle, Coinbase, Gift, Kraken, Ripple, TradeBlock, Unicon, Keza, and BitWallet. All these are major Bitcoin companies, particularly BitPay and Coinbase, who are the biggest wallet in uh Exchange holders, if you will, BitPesa has to do with um, remittances. Ripple is attempting or trying to attempt to get into um, private slash public blockchains for uh, corporations. Kraken right now is overseeing the Mt. Gox. Um, ex- they're the exchange is overseeing the distribution whenever that happens of. Uh, the coins, if you will, and the fiat. Gift is a uh, platform where you can take your Bitcoins and exchange it for gift cards. I've used it in the past. It's pretty good. It doesn't have all everything or anyone, and this really just has to do with the whole gift card and digital market, digital uh, gift card market, really. Circle was that Australian uh, company that no longer accepts Bitcoin or distributes Bitcoin. Um, They've gone into other areas, if you will. Uh, But very uh, early on when they were doing it, uh, they were very easy to use credit or debit card usage of purchasing and buying or making it easier for people to obtain Bitcoin. Unicon, uh, I talked about it um, when discussing um, Purse.io. They're an Indian-based company that allows for uh, people within India to be able to trade ruples for Bitcoin. And BitWallet is another wallet in Keza. And so if you hear his name, Barry Selva, he's been pretty active on the Twitter and block spheres in talking about um, the block size debate. Um, we'll get into his positions um, when we actually get into the technical details. But when you hear his name, I, I just want you to have an understanding like what his financial stake is in the whole matter of as a business and his influence, if you will, on the debate, because he, as is stated here, he has over 40 different companies. Uh, Digital Currency Group is a big investor in the Bitcoins uh, and the cryptocurrency space. So he has a lot of influential impact. Um, he has a significant stake in the cryptocurrency space. So his viewpoint has a bit of a weight, if you will, in people 
either agree or disagree his viewpoint, but when he states something, people are retweeting it or sharing it, whether it be through, you know, mostly Twitter, but Twitter, blog posts, things of that nature. So when he says something about um, the block size debate and what his position is, people are going to listen to him. Um, he's also responsible for launching the Bitcoin Investment Trust, which shares under the, the ticker GBTC, uh, the first publicly quoted security solely investment in deriving value from the price of Bitcoin. Bit gives investors a chance to benefit from Bitcoin price movement through a traditional investment vehicle without the challenges of buying, storing, safekeeping Bitcoin. Now, Roger Ver, um, he's the first person in the world to start investing in Bitcoin startups. He helped fund the C rounds of the entire first generation of Bitcoin businesses, almost solely by himself. He's also known in the community as Bitcoin Jesus. Ver believes that Bitcoin technology is a perfect fit for volunteerism, the idea that all human interactions should be mutually consent or not at all. Uh, in 2011, his company, uh, Memory Dealers, became the first mainstream company to start and accept Bitcoin as payment. Uh, he also launched Bitcoin in store. He also controls Bitcoin.com, um, the first website in the world to accept Bitcoin as a payment. And later, Veer created Bitcoin Bounty Hunter, which rewards people for helping catch cyber criminals in the Bitcoin space. Uh, he has been a vocal credit of the online Bitcoin community, uh, censorship on Reddit, and offering his own censorship portray alternative discussions and cryptocurrency related topics so he started our btc uh recently we were issued a hundred thousand usd challenge to president of candidate bernie sanders if he agreed to debate iraq veteran and anti-war activist adam kush a uh, will split a hundred thousand usd between sanders and kush donating fifty thousand usd each to a charity of their choice i don't believe that actually even happened uh, he's a big supporter of the Ross Ulbrich Fund. Uh, he's matched uh, several different rounds of charity giving to keep um, the lawyers for Ross Ulbrich's um, plea case going. Uh, he's also uh, responsible for Bitcoin Unlimited, or BEU, which is a solution that was proposed by him and uh, his team of devs, if you will, uh, to address the block block debate, he is a proponent of increasing the block size. Um, again, we'll get in those technical terms. But again, because he's one of the first investors, uh, because he also has different companies in place, and one of them is actually Shapeshift. I, I thought that was Eric Boris, but it's Roger Veer and Barry Silbert that it invested in Shapeshift. Uh, so he has different companies and different uh, stakes, and because he's one of the first, you know, from the very beginning business guys to come into the space, he has a significant influence on the topic and discussions about whether or not, you know, SegWit is a solution, if a Lightning Network is something. Um, when people, when he talks, people listen. Um, he's done debates about, um, and we'll get into that, about um, the block size in itself. Um, there's a, a YouTube video where he uh, debates Toyn, Tone Ve, Ve, I think that's how you say his name, about the subject matter. But that, that's a name, if you hear it, um, there's a reason for that because he's one of the first investors and because he has companies in this space. And also because he also um, uh, runs RBTC, or at least um, his company or the people he's put in place run RBTC on Reddit, as well as uh, Bit. Bitcoin.com's uh, company, uh, which is a news outlet and a website for information that he also owns. Now, while Andre Anonopoulos is not a business guy, per se, uh, he, you know, he goes out there and he's just going around and just really advocating, a strong advocate for uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. Um, he's written the books about mastering of Bitcoin. There's a second edition that has come out. So he's a He's an angelitus, if you will, a technical guy that goes out and speaks on the subject of Bitcoin. So Andre, Andreas Antonopoulos, he's a technologist, an entrepreneur, and, and an engaging public speaker who makes Bitcoin easier to understand for the average Joe. He's been a pro prolific proponent of cryptocurrency in general, speaking in front of large crowds in numerous technology and security conferences around the globe. Uh, he's also the author of Master in Bitcoin, a technical guide to understanding Bitcoin. He's been a popular guest on the Joe Rogan experience. Uh, he also advises newer, newer startups and even appeared before the Canadian Senate to help them evaluate the best uh, regulatory approach. 
He's largely known to use the phrase the Internet of Money as early as 2013 to describe Bitcoin. Um, Antonopoulos has launched several community open source projects, is widely published author of Bitcoin related article, and is a permanent host on the Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast. So he's another person that has spoken on the, on the debate of the block size. Um, again, we'll get into technical um, aspects of it, but when you hear that name, just so you know the reference of it, if you have, you don't know quite why people are listening to him or downplaying him. Um, again, he's another early, early adopter of Bitcoin, an early advocate of Bitcoin, and he has two different books on the subject of Bitcoin out there, plus a podcast called Let's Talk Bitcoin. Um, Adam Back is a pioneer in cryptography and has worked on eCash protocols since 1995. His invention includes Hashcash, the proof of work and decentralized money function used in Bitcoin. Hashcash has also been used in a number of other protocols, such as combating block spam. Uh, Back also worked as a developer of zero knowledge systems on its Freedom Network, which was a precursor to Tor. He's been an active member of the Bitcoin community, frequently commenting on issues such as scalability, privacy, and mining technology. Uh, today, he is the CEO at uh, Spoonnose Tech Limited and represent and president of Blockstream. Uh, Blockstream has a lot of the core developers in it. Uh, we'll talk about them um, as we go through these people. In February 2016, Blockstream closed a $55 million USD Series A funding round to advance its vision and technology including working on a sidechain prototype called Liquid. So Eric Voorhees is another um, Bitcoin guy. He is he's a co-founder of a company called CoinPult, worked as a direct name marketer for BitInstant. Um, he's a partial owner of a Bitcoin gambling website called Sushi Dice, which he sold in July 2013. Uh, he was fined for... Um, by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission for unregistered stock offerings related to Satoshi Dice. Oh, okay, and he is part of Shake Ship. I don't know. He's the creator and CEO of the Instant Bitcoin and Alcoin Alcoin Ship Exchange Ship. I have been founded and operated on the alias Moron Gorthon to reveal his true involvement with the company as part of a C funding announcement in March 2015. So yeah, um, he's been a big advocate about you know, and pretty very transparent when it comes. To his businesses, even though he's had some issues. I think he probably learned his lessons early on, particularly with BitInstant, if you will. Um, the issues there, uh, Satoshi Dice was one of those gambling websites. He sold it for 126,315 bitcoins, uh, which at the time was uh, valued at 11.5 million, which now, if you can say he kept all of it, which would be worth two hundred and twenty-six million in U.S. dollars. It's some change, almost two hundred two hundred twenty-seven million dollars. So he is a um, early investor, early creator in the Bitcoin space. When he talks about Bitcoin and the block size and the future of Bitcoin, again, he's a name that people listen to. He will gravitate to. He has a business shapeshift that a lot of people utilize. People get try to get their tokens and coins utilized through shapeshift because uh, shapeshift, the way it works as a company, you basically you don't uh, purchase coins through them. Uh, you don't buy coins through them. What you do is you use your already existing coins, whether it be Bitcoin, Dogecoin, Litecoin, or Ethereum, and then you switch it into a different coin. So, if, for example, if you wanted to take your Ethereum coins and you wanted to switch to uh, storage coins because you wanted to get into the uh, storage, which is the uh, blockchain based uh, cloud service, which is going from Ethereum to from Bitcoin to Ethereum, then you sh- what is called shift your coins and they take a bit of a cut or a value. So say, for example, say one, I'm not going to get the exact numbers right now, but one Ethereum's worth, uh, I don't know, thousand storage coins um they might trade it at a different value maybe they'll give you 899 uh storage coins for one ethereum so that's their little cut they're a little bit high there's been other um crypto switcher coins out there that were a little bit less than their take but right now they, they they're the big daddy in the game really they're pretty, they're pretty much the one who's lasted the longest um, they have a lot of different both tokens and cryptocurrency coins out there 
um, they have a significant influence. They also have what's called the Shapeshift Buy, where you can add it to your website. So somebody who um, um, is into Ethereum or uh, Dash can purchase their coins um, using that button Dash, and you as a vendor, you know, you you receive Bitcoin on your end. So you don't have to be concerned with that, and the person using Dash doesn't have to be concerned about switching themselves out into getting Bitcoin. Uh, they can use Dash to purchase their items. So because of that, again, you know, his merchant influence, if you will, um, is significant. Uh, Peter Schiff, he's a, another business guy. He's an investment broker, uh, author, financial commentator, radio personality. He has been in the you know, traditional financial um, area for a very, very long time. Uh, he has been investing into the Bitcoin cryptocurrency space. He's been doing it for extremely, um, pretty early, pretty early, pretty early in the space. His um, position really is a little different from everyone else's. Um, well, he's an investor. He doesn't see Bitcoin as a cash platform, but he sees it as a payment platform, if you will, which is very different. He's invested in BitPay, and he sees it as a means of basically transferring wealth and not necessarily all the other components associated with um, Bitcoin, which some people in the space are like that. They see Bitcoin as a store of value and um, not necessarily complete, totally just as a cash type system or the internet of money, but a payment platform that might be better than one day, you know, one day than Visa or our MasterCard or credit or a credit card. And these are just a few of the people that in this space that you're going to hear their names a lot. I want to go through some other people, but I also want you to read a few statements from some businesses that the people that we talked about, like for example, um, Barry Silbert's uh, Coinbase on the whole box size debate. So this came out March 19th by David Farmer, who's the director of BizOps at Coinbase. So an update for customers with Bitcoin stored on Coinbase. We want to provide customers notice of how possible a hard fork of the Bitcoin protocol into the Bitcoin core and Bitcoin Unlimited will affect Coinbase accounts. Um, this, is at, this is still something being debated, but at the time it seemed like Bitcoin Unlimited in March might overtake the uh, Bitcoin core usage. The only version of Bitcoin supported on Coinbase platform today is Bitcoin Core, currently represented by the symbol BTC. We may provide support for Bitcoin Unlimited in the future depending on market conditions and stability of the protocol, but we cannot guarantee whether or when such a support may be available. Customers who wish to access both blockchains at the time of the hard fork should withdraw their BTC from Coinbase since we cannot guarantee that it will happen during the hard fork or when the access will be available. If one chain receives an overwhelming majority of support from miners, users, and exchanges, we reserve the right to alter the names of the chains or just to continue support for certain chains in the future. Ensuring the safety of customer funds is our top report priority. In the event of a hard fork of the Bitcoin protocol, it's likely that Coinbase will temporarily suspend the deposit and withdrawal of Bitcoin from the platform. Pending our assessment of the technical risks posed by any fork, such as the possibility of replay attacks, network instability, and other factors. Customers should take note that they will not be able to withdraw Bitcoins from or deposit Bitcoins to Coinbase for a period of up to 24 hours or more following the fork. In the event of a hard fork of the Bitcoin protocol, Coinbase may suspend the ability to buy or sell on our platform during this time. Coinbase looks forward to working with other exchanges and development teams to ensure the smooth execution of future hard forks with as little disruption as possible. Customers should continue to monitor our support pages and Twitter accounts for updates regarding our support for digital currencies on the platform. And I believe recently that um, Coinbase has announced that they will be accepting Litecoin into their platform. Um, this is after Segwit became activated. So yeah, that's where they announced that May 3rd. They have added support for Litecoin. And another update uh, here, not from Coinbase, but BitPay. We're changing how Bitcoin network costs are paid on Bitcoin invoices. This came March 17th, 2017. 2017 has been an exciting year for Bitcoin. Demand for our secure Bitcoin transaction is at an all-time high, and this is an encouraging sign for 
bid paid for Bitcoin as a technology. However, the increased demand for Bitcoin transactions is also raising the price called a miner fee, or making transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain. As we showed in our recent article on rising Bitcoin miner fees, the cost of processing received Bitcoin payments is also rising. Right now, I believe the medium average is $1 for any type of transaction. Today, that's why today we're announcing a change in how the network costs are included in Big, Big Pay's invoice. What happens after you send a Bitcoin payment? When you make a Bitcoin transaction, you send funds to a Bitcoin wallet or address controlled by another person, or in our case, BitPay. What the payment recipient, recipient receives and then transfers away from the receiving Bitcoin address is called an unspent transaction output. This is a unit of Bitcoin which can actually be used in another Bitcoin transaction. The miner fees paid to combine and sweep UTXOs from Bitcoin's receiving addresses is a major part of BitPay's increased network costs, as reflected in the chart earlier in the post. This cost is not unique to using BitPay. Any business or person accepting on-chain Bitcoin payments will incur the expense of consolidated UTXOs for each payment they receive. Remember that this UTXO consolidated cost is not the same as the miner fee included with your initial payment to the Bitcoin address. Your own miner fee is important in turn the confirmation time for your payment, which is a function of the Bitcoin network and not something which BitPay controls. What's changing? Until now, BitPay has covered the network costs for combining and sweeping UTXOs for the BitPay invoice payments. In order for us to continue processing secure on-chain payment Bitcoin payments without incurring losses as UTXOs consolidate costs increase, as of March 23rd, we will now be automatically adding this network cost to the total cost of paying the BitPay invoice. What does this mean for BitPay merchants and purchasers? Our merchant fees and pricing will not be affected by this change. Uh, businesses using BitPay to accept payments depend on stable, predictable revenue and costs for each transaction we process for them. So we are not adding the often variable network cost onto the current fee cost. For purchasing paying a Bitcoin invoice, it automatically calculated based on current network fees estimate. Network cost will be shown as part of the total amount to be paid. If the network cost is higher than the purchaser is willing to pay, the purchaser can allow the invoice to expire without paying it. The network cost will not have a significant impact on major payments, majority of payments made through BitPay. However, I realize that for many users, this network cost may make smaller payments uneconomical. The Bitcoin network's growth and its growth constraints are forcing innovation around the problem, particularly here at BitPay. We are working digitally to develop new ways to reduce the expense and make it possible to send faster, simpler, and more affordable Bitcoin payments. How Bitcoin users can minimize network costs is If you're concerned about additional network costs on your BitPay payments, we all strongly recommend making Bitcoin purchases in large increments to offset the cost across a large payment value. Bitcoin shines in providing fast settlement times and affordable transfer costs for high value payments. And we hope Bitcoin users will take advantage of these strengths. Any additional payments you have to make to the BitPay invoice will also be charged the network cost. To avoid paying the network cost twice, be sure to pay the exact BTC amount requested on the BitPay invoice. A good way to ensure that you do not overpay or underpay a BitPay invoice is to scan the QR code or pay with a payment protocol compatible with the BitPay wallet app. So they made the change in their invoice, and this is all as a result of the congestion on the, the size of the of the block size as well. And a lot of businesses have made this um, this change. So you have um, BitPay and Coinbase making statements about because of the block size and their adjustments from if there's a hard fork on the case of Coinbase and BitPay because of the network congestion um, raising their prices. And so you have these are wallet providers. They provide wallets and payment processing for merchants. And you have exchanges and you have miners. They're all businesses. You have like, you know, Shapeshift and all these other businesses out there that are processing and accepting Bitcoin um, as in a way of almost like a third party system for people that can't necessarily do it for themselves or don't have the technical usage or, or dabbling in their software protocol to, to do it themselves. And because of that, you also have, you know, these merchant miners, uh, individual individuals using, you know, freelancers or something like that. Um, everyone, in essence, everybody has a say in the network, but um, just kind of focusing on these top business people, um, 
why you're hearing their names and why they may have an influence, if you will, versus um, other people's um, talking about the block size debate. So you have Blockstream. Now, Blockstream is a company that a lot of people have been talking about, and this is what it is. Um, it's one of the most well-funded Bitcoin companies with $76 million in venture capital thanks to the latest $55 million funded round, size chains. Blockstream is yet to fully unveil or explain all this company products is website. However, it explains that Blockstream's core area of innovation is sidechains, a technology focused on improving on the blockchain the most powerful public utility for distributing trust systems. It appears that Blockstream is taking a different approach to blockchains. Instead of creating a separate private blockchain or altcoins, Blockstream will create sidechains to allow for somewhat private blockchains that are built on top of Bitcoin. According to its website, sidechains offer many advantages over the blockchain separate from the Bitcoin because they avoid the rapidity shortage, market fluctuations, fraud mutations, security breach, and outright fraud associated with alternative cryptocurrencies. Liquid. On October 12, 2015, Blockstream announced the release of its Liquid sidechain. Liquid removes the delays and frictions involved in the normal transaction of Bitcoin. Instead of participating exchanges, Bitfix, BTC, Kraken, Unicon, and Expo can make near instant exchanges between their accounts and order books. Lightning Network. Blockstream hired Rusty Russell, a well-known better developer, and famous for his work on Linux kernel, to develop an implementation of the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Russell has a four-part LNN explanation on his blog. Uh, we'll talk about Lightning Network when we get down to the nitty gritty. So the employees of Blockstream are the most prominent and active Bitcoin core developers. There's uh, Gregory Maxwell, uh, Peter Will, Adam, uh, Andrew Polster, Mark Finberg. Uh, these guys work work and develop on the uh, Bitcoin core developers. Um, who else is, let's see, who else is part of Blockstream? Uh, Sam So Mo, who is also another guy that um, talks a lot about the block size debate. Um, um, he and Roger Ver get into it a lot, quite often. Um, Adam Back, that uh, we spoke about. Uh, Luke Dash, who controls the GitHub. Who else is also a um, dev for... Um, that's pretty much it, as far as the devs go. And it's because of this conflict of Glenn Willen, Mark Frankbacher. It's because of this conflict that people have a significant issue the um, block stream and the the block uh, the Bitcoin core devs because they are being paid by Blockstream because they own this company or are part of this company or have a stake in this company and they haven't made any significant upgrades to Bitcoin whether it's activating SegWit whether it's enabling allowing for the Lightning Network whether it's uh, doing any of the proposals that people have put forth about expanding. Uh, are increasing the block size to some of them, uh, one of which was a proposal by Luke Jr. Uh, stating that they want to decrease the block size to some thinking that the block size is perfectly fine. This is something that Gregory Maxwell is stating, as well as Adam Back, that there's this conflict of interest in general. People are getting increasingly more frustrated with uh, the block, uh, the Bitcoin core developers. And that's why you're seeing a lot more outside proposals that are not going through the BIP system that are being developed outside of the control of the Bitcoin core to either force the issue or provide a different types of solution from um, Bcoin, which is a Bitcoin or block extender, which was proposed by Purse.io, which is uh, a company that uh, Barry Silbert has an influence in. Um, well, there's Mumbo Wimbo, which we will talk about. All these different types of solutions that seek to address the the block size that is not being implemented or even considered seriously at all by the Bitcoin core development team. And so you have an increasing um, level of frustration within the community by businesses as a whole that have specifically invested into um, Bitcoin and seeing deeply concerned as in case of Coinbase, if there's a hard fork, if congestions continue having to move off of Bitcoin, 
to go to other coins like Ethereum, like Storage has done, and some other um, companies are considering to build off of so they can do their smart contracts, if you will, or doing um, what they need to do to make their platform work. Um, all this is happening, and it's a result of just this standstill, if you will, in the development um, on the on the part of the big core team. So when you hear Blockstream, that is the name of the company. And as you can see, um, a number of the top level Bitcoin core developers are part of this team. And when they speak out, because they're a Bitcoin core developer, people are listening. But also at the same time, they also, you know, are part of this company called Blockstream. Uh, Charlie Lee is another name you'll hear a lot. Uh, he is an engineer for Coinbase. He's also the creator of iCoin. He and Brian Armstrong also talk about both SegWit and um, block size quite a bit through their Twitter. Uh, the reason why you hear Charlie Lee a lot, again, because he's a creator of Litecoin. Uh, SegWit has recently activated on uh, Litecoin, which is a considered a solution for Bitcoin to address the block size debate. Brian Armstrong is the CEO of Coinbase, so you hear his name quite a bit in discussing and talking about um, what's going on with Coinbase. Uh, he received you know, capital from Barry Siebel. Um He's also another person who talks about it. Both Sam Patterson and Brian Hoffman have made some comments about um, the Bitcoin slide, uh, size debate, they are the creators of Open Bazaar, which is the decentralized online marketplace. Uh, Vital Birchen, who is the one of the creators and founders of the Ethereum, has spoken out about um, the block size debate. Uh, as a founder of a, one of the widely utilized uh, cryptocurrency coins, people do listen to what he has to say about the debate in and of itself. Um, he's more focused on Ethereum, but he does make some comments from now and then about um, the block size debate in and of itself. And I'm really not talking about the positions at this moment because I think it's important to just kind of be familiar with their names more so and who they are and what their placement is and how long they've been part of the community. Uh, Peter Todd, um, He's an advisor on the Coin Kite, uh, which is a uh, which is an advisor that helps uh, different companies work within the block block size um, space. They're responsible for help, helping Open Dime come into existence, if you will. They have a standalone terminal. They have Bitcoin servers. Uh, Peter Chavit is another, he's a core developer and he's another advocate and he also has his business. Um, Open Dime um, will eventually do a review on Hiroja's Thought Bubble, but they're basically um, cyberpunk sticks, cred sticks uh, brought to life. Um, we talked about them in the uh, Silk Road off chain transactions as a means of doing off, tra off, off chain transactions without anybody knowing about it. Open Dime is probably one of the best usages of that. They recently did an update where there's a display where you can see exactly the amount of Bitcoin on the stick itself instead of uh, connecting it to a computer to see. But it's like one of the first um, zero trust physical wallets and super excited about it. Um, I think it's um, a fascinating um, little device in and itself. And then you have the miners, and we're going to do an entire series of episodes devoted, maybe two, actually not series, but two episodes devoted to miners. Uh, really, one is why miners are so important, um, how they came into existence, and why they're such big players in the crypto space, beyond just the fact that they are ensuring the network backbone, but why, why how that went about, and just really who the miners are we're going to break down, particularly given the fact that many of them are located in China. But overall, I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the names and uh, people in the Bitcoin space and really just break down the just like the five key areas that um, Bitcoin businesses are in. They're either wallets, 
they are people that created and coding the different types of wallets that people have from either their their samurai wallet, BitPay, Coinbase, um, Armory, those type of wallets exist out there. And then there's the combo people that are both wallets and exchanges like Coinbase and, um, and BitPay. And then BitPay is also a payment processor like Coinbase. So you have, you know, a payment processor that acts as a um, payment processor for um uh, merchants and individuals or freelancers out there so that they're not really handling the transaction end of Bitcoin. They're receiving it, goes through the process, just like a credit card or debit card system. Um, is pretty much what uh, BitPay and Coinbase do for people. Um, then you have the miners. The miners out there are businesses. There's pool miners out there. There's the, um, most of them are located in China, but not exclusively. They they process the network, and then there's the hardware people. These are the people that create the nodes. There's a business for creating Bitcoin nodes. There's um, hard wallets, the hardware wallets, the physical hard wallets, or like the one-time wallets. Um, and there's ASIC chips that has to do with um, specialized customized chips for um, the miners themselves. They're that type of business is very big and booming. Um, then there's merchants themselves, people that actually accept Bitcoin, um, allowing for transactions by accepting Bitcoin itself. So there's those merchants. And then there's individuals that utilize Bitcoin for either holding, storing, um, spending. These individuals themselves that partake in the um, Bitcoin space. And they may ha hang their sh shingles up as like a freelancer or maybe they are, are traders. Um, they trade Bitcoin. They go and purchase Bitcoin. They go through the local Bitcoins, or they um, do OTC transactions or um, other avenues. They're big traders, and they play the market, if you will. They have a type of a business they will, and maybe they're either individuals or a collective group to trade off this marketplace, and all of them have a stake. Exchanges, the way for people to purchase and buy and trade uh, Bitcoin, have a stake in this um, whole entire avenue. And each of them have spoken out in different ways about whether or not they um, are for this proposal or not, whether it be for SegWit, um, Bitcoin Unlimited, uh, Bitcoin, supporting Bitcoin Core, um, whether or not they've not said really much of anything and they just are, they just don't want anything to be broken. They want to be able to continue their business and they really have not taken any significant position because they might consider it to be too political, if you will. And so they've been mums the word, if you will, on the subject. But all these people, you know, have a stake in what's going to happen with the block size, whether or not it increases or not, and whether or not SegWit gets activated, whether or not a different proposal, if there is an actual fork, whether it's a user um, soft fork or if there's a hard fork, um, every, everybody has a say, if you will. Everyone has a skin in the game. And it pretty much has spoken about the more prominent members in the Bitcoin business class that have uh, made some statements concerning uh, what's going on and, and, and spoken out so when you see their names you kind of know where they are and you know what their stake is um we'll talk about what their positions are when we get into the nitty-gritty of it but i just wanted to highlight who these people are um and what businesses they own so that when you hear their, their name you can judge for yourself whether or not you should be listening to them or be like oh well Peter Todd has this type of company, of course he's going to say that, or, you know, um, Gregory Maxwell, you know, he's a Bitcoin core dev, he's part of Blockstream, which is a business, and he gets paid, and this kind of happens, so when people are throwing these terms out, you kind of know where their origins are, where their placement is, uh, the space is, and you can make the judgment for yourself whether or not you agree, disagree, or disregard of what's being said or stated. So that's it for the Bitcoin business episode. 
Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Hiroshima Space Odyssey Network production.